Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So folks, I have to tell you, the associates give me one job to do, to open and close this event at 6 p.m. It is 6.01, I think, so please let me get going. We are really happy to have you here tonight, so welcome to every single one of you. I'd like to ask everyone in the room to please go ahead and take a seat so we can begin tonight's program. I would encourage you to go that way to get a drink if you haven't and want one, but then absolutely take a, a seat as soon as you can. Again, good evening. My name is Alice Lee, and I am chair of the Associates of the Boston Public Library's Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us tonight. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Writers in Residence Welcome Reception and Reading. I am thrilled to kick off the program tonight. Can't you tell? I feel the energy, you know? This is such an exciting night for us. If you don't already know, the Associates of the Boston Public Library is an independent nonprofit that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the Boston Public Library's historic, literary, and artistic treasures. That's our job. Through targeted grant making to the Boston Public Library um, and cultural events like this one tonight, we ensure that the public in Boston and beyond can continue to be informed and inspired by the BPL's special collections. The special collections contains millions of items from medieval manuscripts and Shakespeare's first folio to contemporary photography collections like the Boston Herald Traveler photo morgue. The special collections also has many items pertaining to children's and young adult genre, young adult genres, including, I like this because I actually know like both of these books I'm gonna mention, the, the 1795 edition of Charles Perrault's Tales of Past Times by Mother Goose and Robert McCluskey's sketchbooks from his iconic Make Way for Ducklings. So no matter who you are, whether you are young or young at heart, there is a moment of discovery waiting for you within the BPL's special collections. Since 1972, the Associates has also been the creator and underwriter of a wide array of programs and events that celebrate writers, books, and libraries, such as our annual fundraiser. Literary Lights, and our public events, the Pierce Performance Series, the 100-Year Book Award, and the Writer-in-Residence Program. If you'd like to learn more, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, you'll be able to do that at a table in, over there by that door, so please do that if you'd like to know about these future events. And for almost two decades, the Writer in Residence program has provided an emerging children's or young adult author with financial and professional support and private office space in this beautiful building. This truly unique program provides a writer with life-changing opportunity to launch their professional career. Associates board member and committee chair, Alan Andres, who's right here tonight, um, has led the Writer in Residence program almost since its inception. Tonight, we will hear from Alan and his two co-chairs, Elaine Demopoulos and Jennifer DeLeon. Elaine and Jen also happen to be Writers in Residence um, alumni, Writers in Residence alumni, and they wrote their debut novels here at the Boston Public Library. On behalf of the associates, I want to thank Alan for his dedication, his leadership, and commitment to making the Writers in Residence program into what it is today, which is very special. It truly is. And we're very grateful for Alan and Elaine and Jen and our volunteer judges who generously give their time and expertise. I also want to thank President David Leonard and the Boston Public Library. And David's over there. David, you got a, a little higher. There he goes. 
That's uh, the president of the Boston Public Library, David Leonard, Leonard, and we really want to thank you and all of your staff for their continued support and their continued partnership. Of course, none of this would be possible without the continued support of the Associates Anonymous donor who has sponsored this program for 20 years. Their generosity has fostered years of creativity and built a supportive community which continues to flourish and grow. So thank you, anonymous donor. And um, now I'd like to call Alan, Alan Andres to the podium. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, as you heard, we've been, do, we've been meeting here for, to introduce the newest writer in residence for nearly two decades. Next year will mark the 20th anniversary of the fellowship program designed to foster the creation of works of literature for children and young adults. It originated at a time when the Associates wasn't even yet defined as an independent nonprofit with its primary focus devoted to the conservation, preservation, and digitization of the BPL Special Collections and underwriting the expansion of its staff of archivists and catalogers. Um, at the time the program was conceived in the fall of 2000, a public library writer and residence fellowship for authors of literature of children and young adults was unique in the world. We weren't aware of that. Um, it just seemed a good idea at the time, but nearly two decades later, it remains the only such program of its type, providing a generous financial support and the use of, the, of a writer's room here at the Boston Public Library. In partnership with the BPL, uh, this serves as a generator for the creation of a new work for readers around the world. And in so doing, the Boston Public Library becomes not only a place where books are found on its shelves, but where they're created as well. For the writers of our fellowship, that we, that we honor in our fellowship, it often comes at a crucial moment in their career. In some instances, our fellowship has literally changed lives, as you heard, by validating and providing freedom to create a new work. In a few minutes, I hope you'll hear some personal stories, but we'll, we'll see. Um, each re recipient receives an annual grant of $23,000 supplemented by an additional stipend to accommodate editorial support. Should our recipients wish to avail themselves of such help, editorial help, it's there. In return, we expect, we expect um, them to work a minimum of 19 hours a week here in the Copley Square and produce a finished manuscript at the end of their tenure. The fellowship's open to emerging writers of promise who have not already established a professional career. Since its inception, the fellowship has used a blind judging process, procedure in which a panel of judges is asked to evaluate a proposed work based on the quality of a brief writing sample and a proposal. The proposals exclude identifying information, name, age, gender, educational background, etc. The panel is traditionally composed of professionals from the book world and range from experienced acquisitions, editors, book critics, teachers of children's literature, uh, published authors, booksellers, librarians, literary agents, and publishing marketing veterans. I wanna thank all the judges who generously volunteer their time each year, especially if any are in the audience tonight. Even though the judges are asked to consider the quality of the writing a priority in its selection, it is understood that nearly all work by a beginning writer reflects fledgling origins. Thus, spotting signs of a distinctive original new voice is given a priority and is, is, is an ability to open a window on lives currently underrepresented on the pages of books that are now available. So, in our efforts to honor authors and the judges believe should be given an opportunity to be heard, we hope eventually book publishers may join us in agreement. Validation and financial support build a writer's early pr uh, progress, but finished manuscript that remains in a drawer unread is one like unlikely to change lives, unfortunately. So what we've been attempting here is something a bit more ambitious with a goal to foster work that will eventually go out into the larger world. It's a bit of a gamble, 
Our decision is based on very short submission, a hunch that there's something here that will eventually undergo a literary metamorphosis and emerge from a multi-draft chrysalis as a book that will find its way onto a library shelf or a bookstore. It's a tall order, maybe even an idealistic one in a cynical age that promotes the exciting possibilities of cheap, authorless, formulaic narratives generated by AI programs using stolen scrapings from popular published works. But over the years, the fellowship program has borne fruit. We're now grateful that literary agents and book editors have taken note of many of our recent fellowship recipients and their work. This is presently demonstrated by the publication of more than 70 original books authored by past honorees, physical books by actual human beings that can be found on the shelves of bookstores and schools and in public libraries. Two books written at the BPL as part of this program were optioned by Hollywood production companies. One of our past Raiders and Residents recipients has gone on to be named a McDowell Colony Fellow. So here is a brief bit of alumni news from the past year. There's a lot happens, I'm only gonna give you some highlights. 2023 saw the publication of two books by past fellowship recipients. Jennifer DeLeon's second novel, Borderless, was released by Athenaeum in April and was featured on today's show's list of recommended summer reading. The Remarkable Rescue at Milkweed Meadow by Elaine Demopoulos was published by Charles Bridge in May and earned a rare stellar trifecta of starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Carcass, and Booklist. Uh, Elaine will and Jen serve as co-chairs of the Writer and Residence Fellowship Committee and you will hear from Elaine after I'm done, and she will introduce our writers. Jen was supposed to be here tonight, but unfortunately she cannot make it, so I'm sorry to say. Um, six weeks ago, another book came out, All You Have to Do. It's a, no it's a novel by Autumn Allen, who wrote it during her 2020-2021 fellowship residency, and it came out from Penguin Random House. It also garnered a number of star advance reviews and was recently appeared on the list of People Magazine's 20 must read books for the fall. So, um, let's see. and the, for those of you who were here last year, I mind you that coming in 2025 from Candlewick Press is Katie Doty's graphic novel, How to Survive the End of the World. And also in 2025, is another graphic novel by our 2011-2012 writer and resident Sarah Winifred Searle. And I would like to say that's the beginning because you will hear more tonight, but I'm not gonna spoil that news. Um, a word for any aspiring writers interested in applying for next year's residency, application forms and requirements will be posted on our website in early 2024. And it can be found at, and I have to do this slowly, www.writer-in-residence.org. All right. Uh, we have many to thank, and Alice already thanked some of them, and I just want to keep going and mention them again. Our anonymous benefactor, who single-handedly has unwritten this program for almost 20 years, the Board of the Associates, which has provided its continued support, and some of the board members are right here in the room. And a special thanks to the Associates Executive Director, Louisa Bissett, who tireless keeps everything in the program running smoothly in the background. And as Alice noted, we couldn't do this without the partnership with the Boston Public Library and President David Leonard's enthusiastic support. For nearly two decades, the BPL has generously provided the use of the oak-lined room of one's own, which our writers find their inspiration. So finally, and I've gone on a bit, I want to indulge you in a little word about public libraries and a bit of history. As many are aware, this year will set the record for the highest number of attempted challenges to remove books from the library shelves uh, recorded by the American Library Association when they started 
compiling this data. Many of us who have devoted their lives to the creation of publication and distribution of books, this feels personal. I grew up in a New England town, settled in 1641, one of the very first towns in the state, yet that town did not even open its own public library for another 337 years. I was out of college when the library finally opened. Um, all too often, we take libraries for granted. The room we're in almost seems an objective correlative for the spiritual, emotional, and transcendental role public libraries play in the life of our, the readers. This room was originally at Boston Public Library's book delivery room, where volumes requested from the collection were transported and carefully handed over to the BPL's patrons. On the walls are murals by Edwin Austin Abbey depicting the quest of the grail, a, a visual narrative metaphor conveying the understood quest for knowledge. In fact, Galahad's quest even involves confronting bad advice and the need to think for oneself. In other words, he actually read books that he realized were bunk. What one does when accessing information is they learn from their mistakes and you make, make new, your own judgments. I detail this history somewhat ironically as not all books in the Boston Public Library were in fact free to all here in Boston. The holy quest for knowledge did not include titles that were locked away in a special room the BPL had and was not, they did not allow it to circulate. This room was infamous, infamously known as the Inferno Catalog. At the very moment Edwin Austin Abbey created these murals, widely understood to celebrate the superior Western European cultural tradition, one of the obstacles facing the BPL patron on his or her hero's journey for knowledge and enlightenment was the Boston's own Watch and Ward Society. Remember, Tennyson informed us Galahad had the strength of 10. Why? Because his heart was pure. No Oscar Wilde, Zola, or Boccaccio for you. <laughs> the fervent followers of Anthony Comstock believed that it was their duty to keep others' minds and hearts pure so they could not be trusted to have the fortitude of Galahad. Now, we may look back on this bit of local history with a smile of amused self-satisfaction, but bear in mind what is happening in other libraries all over the country today, and remember never to take libraries or those who work in them for granted. As pure-hearted Galahad looks down on us, we celebrate a very different kind of heroic quest tonight. Our writers are engaged in the creation of new, original, and possibly even life-changing books. We trust they have the freedom and courage to feel they must not conform to the whims of those who believe it is their mission to protect us. And if we are lucky, their books will be discovered on another library shelf somewhere and never forcibly removed or ignominiously locked away in an inferno. And that is... I am done, and I'm going to turn this over to Elaine Demopoulos, who will introduce our outgoing writer in residence. Thank you, Alan, and hear, hear. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Elaine Demopoulos, and I love this event and this special community. I feel so fortunate to be a part of it. And it is my pleasure this evening to introduce the Associates' outgoing writer in residence, Rhonda DeChambeau. Rhonda, you're a joy to introduce since your tenure as writer in residence has been so wildly successful. We're going right to it. During Rhonda's year, she signed with a literary agent who subsequently sold her novel in verse, Top Heavy, to Holiday House in a two book deal, something that rarely happens to a sitting writer in residence. So congratulations on this incredible accomplishment, Rhonda. And for those unfamiliar, Holiday House uh, was, is a publishing house that was established in 1935. It's the first American publish, ha, publishing house founded with the purpose of publishing only children's books. It has a deep list of timeless and award-winning books for children and young adult readers. And because of her book contract, Rhonda uh, will turn 
her top heavy manuscript into the associates tonight, but it will be kept under lock and key until after its publication in 2025, at which point it will be released into the BPL's collection and made accessible to patrons should they wish to see it, as all the writers in residence manuscripts have traditionally been. When she isn't writing, Rhonda works as a human resources professional for the Department of Veterans Affairs. She has a degree in English from Harvard University, and she graduated in 2019 with her master's in fine arts in writing for children and young adults from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Rhonda is a lifelong Massachusetts resident where she lives with her husband and two children. I had the pleasure of reading a recent draft of Rhonda's manuscript, Top Heavy, that she wrote here, and I would like to say three things about it. First, I intended to read only a few pages to remind myself of the gist of the project, but ended up reading the whole novel in one sitting. It's that good. Second, it hit me that one of the reasons it's so good is that this novel does for today's teen and preteen readers what Judy Bloom's novels do for her readers. As many of you know, Top Heavy is about Esme, a 15-year-old dancer who learns to stand tall despite having breasts so large that she considers reduction surgery. Rhonda describes the scabbing on Esme's shoulders from where her bra straps dig in. She describes her feeling of relief when she can rest her breasts on a table for a moment. She describes Esme and her friends talking and thinking about their bodies in the curious, uncertain, and frank way teens really do. This novel goes there, the way Bloom goes there in her work, while also presenting a character with a fully developed family and school life and with big dreams. Rhonda's readers will celebrate her story for the way it gives voice to their lived experiences. Finally, another reason it's so good is that Rhonda's poems in her novel in verse gracefully guide the reader through Esme's inner life. At times, the tone is plaintive. At other times, Rhonda thunders us awake with a description of Esme's father crashing through an old staircase and injuring his back, or a wolfish predator assaulting Esme in a dark dance club. We can't turn away, and the music of her language is a big part of the reason we stay. But don't take my word for it. Without further ado, may I present the 2022-2023 Associates of the Boston Public Library Writer-in-Residence, Rhonda DeChambeau. <laughs> I was not expecting such high praise, but thank you, Elaine. Um, it's been really quite a year uh, to all the members of the Associates of the Boston Public Library and to our anonymous benefactor, I just have to say thank you. Um, thank you for this amazing program and the commitment to keep it going year after year. This is truly an amazing opportunity for writers trying to launch their careers. I speak from experience. And the writers in this area of the country are very lucky to have it. You are giving writers a place to be seen and expanding the world of literature for young people. So many of you know by now that I have applied for this opportunity multiple times before I was selected with Top Heavy. Um, so for all those writers in the audience who are out there and maybe you think you've already been passed over, I applied six times. Keep applying. The judging panel changes every year, and you never know who's going to be a fan of your work. So keep applying. I'd also like to thank with all my heart Alan Andres, Luisa Bissett, Laura Russo, and Vidisha Argawala. That wonderful team made me enjoy my time here even more. Special thanks, too, to Jen DeLeon and Elaine Demopoulos for being so encouraging and offering me terrific advice. Special thanks to my family for all of their love and support, their cheering, and their hugs this past year to my in-laws, Fred and Noreen, my husband, Chris, my daughter, Donna, and my son, Colin. 
they were very patient in sharing me with the library this, these past 12 months, so I appreciate so much their unending support. And I also need to thank my community of writers from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. I am grateful to them for all of their support and their wisdom and their love. Um, and a special shout out too to the wonderful writers I've met through the New England Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and through the Writing Barn. Um, I have a lot of great memories from this past year. Um, Vidisha actually helped me post a guest blog, so you can check that out where I sort of wax on about all my experiences over the past year. I was able to um, speak at the North End branch for a small group of eighth grade students and I talked about finding empathy through reading. Um, I attended the Literary Lights Dinner and I hosted a couple of poetry workshops for our youngest patrons and helped out with a couple of high school uh, groups in Teen Central. So special thanks to those librarians that are doing this important work every day. Uh, Laura Koenig, Julia Hurwitz, Amy Boglarski, Eileen Whittle, Chris Jacobs, Bree Skywall, and Ashley Runnels. Thank you for being so welcoming to me and inviting me into your world. And of course, extra special thanks to my agent, Elizabeth Bennett, who is here tonight. Um, she sought me out after I won the fellowship and she welcomed me with a great conversation here in the library. Uh, without her, this book would not have found a home. And what an amazing sense of calm she maintained during our submission process when we were sending it out to different publishers and editors and getting feedback. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and thanks as well to my amazing editor, Sally Morgridge at Holiday House for her warmth and enthusiasm. I've waited a long time to hear an editor say the words, I read the entire manuscript in one sitting and I love it. I'm so glad my book found its perfect home with Holiday House. So I kept a journal during this past year and I thought I'd share with you what I wrote after my first day in the library. It was true that first day and true every day I spent here. Today was good for my soul. So good to be surrounded. Sorry. So good to be surrounded by all the books and beauty, the art and architecture of the Boston Public Library. <clears throat> my little office is sure to become a haven for my thoughts and hopefully an incubator for my story. I feel like myself again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, that's the emotional part. <laughs> I'm, I'm through it. <sighs> so when I look back at my time in the library, mostly I'm going to remember the quiet times in the office writing and taking walks through the McKim and the Boylston buildings and sometimes just writing at the tables or browsing the books. I highly recommend that, Danielle. Um, I even included five Easter eggs from the BPL in my story, so assuming that they all make it through the editorial process, uh, take a look for them when the book comes out. Um, I was asked recently if I ever had writer's block while I was working here, and of course there were times when I wasn't sure what came next in the story. I was having one of those moments one day in the office, and I started peeling an orange and trying to think about what my next scene would be. Peeling an orange, as you know, can be a very sensory experience. The heft of the orange in your hand, the smooth skin, the smell of it as you peel. And I was remembering a friend who was allergic to oranges in a story that she told me once. And the next thing I knew, I was writing. So in my YA novel, Top Heavy, 15-year-old Esme is a dancer with a large chest. Early in the story, her grandmother, Grammy Jean, comes to stay with the family to help out while Esme's father struggles with a serious back injury. The first time I met with my editor, Sally, on the Zoom call, she said, can I just say, I love Grammy Jean? To which I replied, I love Grammy Jean too. Um, so I thought I'd share a bit of Grammy Jean in this reading. These poems are from early on in Top Heavy. And what you need to know is that Esme has been assigned a lab partner in chemistry, Celine. Celine is pretty and popular, and she's also a senior. 
She's very different from Esme, and it's kind of fun to see how that relationship evolves in the story. So we're starting with Celine. Celine's idea of perfect. Celine hasn't done the pre-lab we had for homework. We stand at our lab station and I let her copy mine because I just need to get this done. I read the instructions. She grimaces, putting on her goggles. I follow the steps and she hands me things. At least she can follow directions. You're pretty smart, huh? I shrug and say, I just did the reading, hoping she'll take the hint. I bet you get A's all the time. I shrug again and say, my parents are on my case about getting into a good college. This is only part true. They want me to get into a good college, but they don't really get on my case. It's up to me how hard I work, so I work hard for me. You should totally come, Celine says. When I look up, she grins. To the Halloween party at Megan Matheson's? It's going to be great. Costumes, OMG. You know who you should be? That country lady. You know, Dolly Parton. She says it like it's the most original idea she's had all year. It probably is. That would be perfect for you. Yeah, I say, perfect. Grammy Jean peels an orange. When I get home from school, Grammy Jean is in the kitchen, peeling an orange. Her fingers mesmerize, working the orange in her hands like it is clay to be molded. She peels away the skin into a neat pile on the table. She sees me and knows right away something is on my mind. There is no hiding anything from Grammy Jean. And for a minute, I realize my dad must not have gotten away with anything in high school. I tell her about the Halloween party, about Celine's earth-shattering idea that I should go as Dolly. Why, Grammy Jean asks, because you're big busted? Who says that? Big busted, only Grammy Jean. Yes, Grammy. Hmm. Grammy Jean keeps peeling, using her manicured nails to pluck away the pith. Do you know, Grammy Jean says, every time I peel an orange, I think of my friend Diane. She taught accounting at the local community college. She was allergic to oranges. Which is just a good reminder that people as a species can be allergic to anything. One day Diane was teaching and a student in the front row had an orange. Do you know Diane didn't say anything? Grammy waves the orange in front of her, naked now without its peel. She kept teaching as the woman peeled the orange. Diane's nose itched, her throat scratched, her eyes started to water, and still she said nothing. She kept going until finally she had to excuse herself to get some air. It makes me think what they taught me in a CPR class years ago, that sometimes people who are choking will run from a room instead of asking for help. They are too embarrassed or too polite to interrupt dinner. Which is just a good reminder that people as a species are embarrassed by all the wrong things. Listen to me. Why am I telling you all of this, Esme? She asks, handing me half the orange. I shake my head and stuff a slice in my mouth, hoping I don't choke. Stop being so damn polite. And for God's sake, never let embarrassment stand in the way of what might be a matter of life or death. Let me tell you. And let me tell you something else. One could do worse than be compared to Dolly Parton. That woman has made her mark on this world. Do you know she gives free books to toddlers and banned uniforms to high school kids? She writes all her own songs and came up from nothing poorer than poor. Let me tell you she's smart, funny, sassy, generous, and kind. Anyone with half a head of sense would be proud to go as Dolly. Yes, Grammy, Dolly is great, but that's not the point. And I'm not sure we're talking about life or death here. 
Grammy grabs fistfuls of the orange peels and throws them into the trash. Oh, Esme, honey, aren't we? And that's where I'll leave you. Thank you. just shared that uh, this place sometimes makes me tear up a little bit as well. Uh, it really is a special, special place. And I, I love the fact that while we will not be keeping this in the inferno during its embargoed period, um, it is uh, nicely under lock and key. So everything will get respected and it will get, as is now our tradition, added to our collection um, for later access. Uh, good evening, uh, I'm David Leonard, President of the Boston Public Library. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I will just have a few, uh, few words and then the program can continue. Um, not only do we want to thank the writers in our audience here tonight, but we really want to thank deeply the associates and all of the donors and supporters that help make this work come to life. We could not do it without you. Um, and I would just add that I don't think it's a secret to some of you, but this is actually one of my favorite events of our, of our year. Um, so thank you for all that you do and make possible. There are, and why? Let me tell me why. Um, there are approximately 23 million items in our collection. The vast majority of them are books and manuscripts. It's the third largest library collection in the US. And so tonight is special for a couple of reasons, because it is simply a privilege to be here to witness the birth of one of those objects that will go on to be part of that collection. And it is a special gift to recognize individuals who can tap the language that children and young people can experience reading through. So we get to do all of that this evening and celebrate you know, those who are not just at the end of a chapter, but maybe at the beginning of the next chapter. And so thank you for being part of our world. And um, those 19 hours that, Allison, uh, that Alan talked about, um, you know, that office is right next to mine. So I hear the shuffling back and forth. That's all I hear, but I hear the shuffling back and forth and the door opening and closing. And it reminds me, ah, the work, is, the work is happening, or the orange is peeling, or whatever the, uh, whatever the opportunity is that, that's going on. Um, so thank you to our writers, thank you to the associates, and this will be in safekeeping, and now we'll continue with the program. Thank you all. Hello again. I am thrilled to announce that the Associates 2023-2024 residency goes to Danielle Emerson based on her outstanding submission, Shigande Ba Halne, The Stories of Home. Danielle is a Diné writer originally from Shiprock, New Mexico on the Navajo Nation. She earned a BA in Education Studies and a BA in Literary Arts from Brown University. She now lives in Providence, Rhode Island. As the 21st writer in residence, Danielle will spend the next year writing an anthology of 10 varying length short stories with themes of family, culture, tradition, growth, grief, healing, home, community, queerness, and identity. Each story will be accompanied by a personal preface akin to a narrative piece offering a glimpse into the forthcoming stories. I have a few glowing quotations from this year's panel of writer-in-residence judges. One of them said, Danielle writes with great heart and has an original, knowing voice. The world needs her insights now more than ever. Another said that she writes with elegance, honesty, and insight. 
her work is a welcome contribution to the rich literary tradition of indigenous peoples. And yet a third said, with the grace of words and the gift of imagination, Danielle's writing tessellates with the details of lives long absent from the pages of books for children and young adults. Her stories will linger, beckoning the reader back into their world and echoic characters. I had the pleasure of reading Danielle's fiction proposal myself and find that she has an immense gift for describing the complex yet enduring bonds between family members, even when these bonds are frayed by trauma, illness, death, or the ability of a young family member to conjure fire on his palm. She writes, of a tired child letting a father talk on and on because she's all he has in the world, of siblings finding meaning at a funeral, not in memories of the deceased, but in an ancestral song they share, of a young woman who dreams of going someplace far away with concrete and skyscrapers and fancy theaters, yet who grabs her younger sibling's hands, raises them to the sky, and promises them that they can live there with her. In her writing, Danielle shows us that life can be heavy and lonely, but love is never lost. Although you started your residency last week, on behalf of the associates, please allow me to welcome you officially to the library, Danielle. We all know you have an amazing year ahead of you. Congratulations. Thank you for, that was way more elaborate than I thought it was going to be, so I really appreciate all the kind words. Um, so to start, yeah, I'm Danielle Emerson, and I'm a class of the initial, and I'm a class of the Bastos Chain, 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 and I'm a class of so hello, I'm Danielle. I am the Red Cheek Clan, born for the Tangled Clan. My maternal grandfather is the Salt Clan, and my paternal grandfather is Red Running Into the Water People Clan. I am from Shiprock, New Mexico, and I'm a Diné Navajo woman. Um, before I start, I, we should pay respects to the people of the Massachusetts and Pawtucket tribes. They are communities that are living and resisting presently. We also give honor to the land itself, which was stolen from and remains sacred to the, the Massachusetts and Pawtucket peoples. So as you heard before, my project will be a heartfelt collection of young adult short stories detailing contemporary Diné or Navajo um, life and culture. Um, each story is inspired by a unique experience, whether that's a name, a dream, or a memory, drawing from a place of home, wherever that may be. So my inspiration for this project started with a need to heal, um, a need to combat native and indigenous erasure in published YA and children's books. According to the 2022 um, the Cooperative Children's Book Center, 1.5% of children's books um, are written by indigenous peoples. I grew up surrounded by my loved ones and culture, but I did not see books about and by native authors, especially not in school. I want to encourage and uplift positive representation of Native and Indigenous people, especially for younger readers of middle grade and YA. Um, this need for support and care for my Diné community has always been um, my motivation for writing the short story collection. So I want to thank so many people for supporting my writing. Firstly, my mom and my late father, uh, my younger siblings, Truman, Taylor, and Sarah, all of which couldn't be here because they're back home in Shiprock, New Mexico. <laughs> um, my auntie, um, Angie, my cousins, Arvin and Nina. I also want to thank my friend, Michael White and Lainey Knudsen. <laughs> um, I also want to thank my close friend, Rosalind, for all those years in undergrad sitting with me writing as I complained about writing. Um, I also want to shout out to my friend, Eric. He's also a writer. And thank you to my partner, Nathaniel, for uplifting and encouraging my writing, especially as we figure out life together. Um, also, thank you to all my previous mentors, um, Professor Rick Moody, Laird Hunt, um, Emily Hipchen, and Sarah D'Angelo. Um, they all saw promise in my work and provided so much support. And finally, thank you to the Associates of the Boston Public Library for providing such an amazing opportunity. Um, I will now start my reading. So this is an excerpt from a short story in progress titled Before Jordan Left. 
Christopher Sosi had just turned five the day he learned he could summon fire. Jordan was settling into 15, and Jason Riley, their seven-year-old orphan cousin, had just moved in with them. Their masana wasn't doing too well, and their mother was still getting over the disappearance of her sister. All things considered, Christopher's gift could not come at a worse time. Jason was still getting used to calling their mother auntie, while Jordan and Christopher were still getting used to not having their actual aunt around. Names were being forgotten and remembered. Faces were growing older and developing shadows. Not exactly the best time to learn that a mother's youngest son, a sister's younger brother, and a distant cousin's younger distant cousin could summon fire along the expanse of his tiny palms. Christopher doesn't remember how it happened. All he knows is what his family told him. Jordan swears his entire left arm caught fire. Jason says smoke sprung from his ears. And their mother, well, their mother still doesn't believe it. Even after witnessing Chris Christopher accidentally set their tattered couch on fire during his sixth birthday, or after watching Christopher burn a hole straight through their kitchen table after Jason kept calling him the guest for crying at said birthday party. It wasn't that she didn't see it, because Christopher knew somewhere deep down that she knew. She just liked pretending. At seven, Christopher liked playing the game, testing how much fire it took for their mother to react. But he couldn't really control this ability, not like the children in comics could. Something always went wayward. The wrong tree always caught fire, or the wrong hand always drew flames, or the wrong sparks always fed the hearth. Yet, even when he took it too far, which always seemed to happen, their mother never said anything. Jordan suspected it was because Aunt Elizabeth could also bend fire. She was like Christopher, or Christopher was like her, and she went missing for it. Or at least that's what their mother believed. Maybe their mother anticipated his disappearance. Or maybe a tiny voice in the back of his tiny head or maybe a tiny voice said in the back of his tiny head, she blamed Christopher for the loss of her sister. Hell, with how insane things had been, maybe their mother just hated fire. Christopher didn't know. Once he turned 15, Jordan moved out at 25, and Jason moved into their old room at 17. The nights Christopher managed to claim some control over his fire, he snuck out with Jordan and Jason, climbing behind red rocks and thick patches of loose sand. The dancing flame on his palm guided them, turning the cold, chilled air into a warm embrace. He'd make a small fire. Jason gathered a bunch of sticks, and Jordan collected clumps of dead weeds. They'd sit there for hours, under a plethora of singing stars, listening to the deep breaths of the land around them. In these quiet moments, the trio laid on their back, speaking in whispers. Every now and then, Christopher strengthened the fire, fighting exhaustion. They went around in a circle, clockwise. Jordan always talked about leaving. She'd wipe stray hairs from her eyes, from her face, eyes glazed over. The tip of her tongue strung words together like yarn, coiling it around their ears, setting it on fire. When she spoke, the burning in Christopher's stomach dulled to a soft mother of smoke. The big city was her dream, always had been. Someplace far away, she'd say frowning at the mud lining her sneakers, someplace with concrete and skyscrapers. Jason and Christopher could feel the hunger in her voice, telling stories for the stage, building worlds within worlds. She nudged one of them, gesturing to the sky, tethering voices into nooks, living dozens of feet above the ground. Christopher listened with wide eyes, while Jason merely turned dirt over in his hands. Christopher didn't know what was in the big city that would help her. In fact, Christopher didn't understand why she needed to leave in order to do all that. Jordan did all of that now, in the dirt, surrounded by dry weeds, caught between two sister mesas. Sure, there were no skyscrapers, and each evening they'd have to dust off their shoes to keep from dragging dirt in the house, for their feet always seemed to be covered in dirt. But even though Christopher spent each night dusting off his socks before climbing into bed, he thought they had something better. No, he knew home had something better, something much bigger than silver skyscrapers. He just couldn't put his finger on it. But it sat heavily on his chest, a nice weight comforting that he didn't want to lose. 
Then again, Christopher had never stepped off his homeland. The thought never appealed to him. He wasn't even sure if Jordan knew what she was talking about. She'd never been there to know. They had nothing to go on, only stories passed down by unknown travelers, aged books, most yellowed and water damaged, piled against the walls of their rundown community library. But Christopher doubted cities knew what it was like to hear siblings' laughter echo against red rock, springing between crevices before being released into open blue sky. Tasted the smell of fresh clay, dissolving on the tips of their tongue, filling air after heavy rainfall. The sun running its hands up and down their arms, hugging them from behind. He doubted the sun in the city was as loving. But even so, Christopher knew Jordan. He knew that once she wanted something, she'd work as hard as she could to get it. You can all come visit me. Jordan grabbed their hands. We'll live above the ground together. She raised their arms toward the sky. Us, Mom, Shema Sana, and Aunt Beth. Doesn't that sound amazing? Jordan was never the first to let go. She held on until Jason and Christopher awkwardly pulled their hands away. She'd smile sheepishly at them. And Christopher always returned her smile, drawing themselves closer together before leading them back, the fire in his hand a torch against the black sheet of night. All right, thank you. Danielle, thank you so much. Um, I'm the mother of four daughters. Sadly, they're all in their late 20s or early 30s. But I was back there listening to you and thinking, these are the books that my children would be reading if they were younger. They're the books I would be reading to them. They're the, and, and, and David Leonard's comments really made me think about it. We are here experiencing what a few years from now will be amazing history. That your mom got this award and is writing these books, that Danielle is here writing books about you know, different aspects of Native American children's lives and living. We are so fortunate to have you with us and to have you here in the library this year. We've been so fortunate to have you. I feel like I am the luckiest woman in the world and I haven't written a word, you know, just to be here with you because we are, what we do today, 10 years from now, we're gonna look back and say, well, you know, I knew her when. And I, I took a picture with her. So you may have seen me back there snapping pictures. I'm like, this might be the only time I can prove that I knew you when. But I want to thank you so much for sharing your heart and soul, for sharing your care about the lives of young people, and in your case particularly, the lives of young women. This um, means so much to so many young people all over the world. And um, I will probably have my grown girls read these books anyway, because it's important and it's really so beautiful. So thank you. Oh. Thank you, that's very kind of you. This is one of the ways that they don't like that I'm the chairperson of the associates. I just go off script. But anyway, I'm gonna get back on it now. So that was amazing and fabulous. And I meant every word that I said. So I'm so excited that you're gonna be here this year. And we are all very incredibly proud of Rhonda and all of our alumni's accomplishments. I'm gonna ask you before you leave, if you haven't already, please sign, stop at the table near the door and peruse some of the books that have been written by our, our prior, um, our alumni, including Jen, Elaine, and Autumn's latest novels. There are also materials there about the associates. If you would like to learn more about our preservation work or find me or the associate staff, so there's Louisa there. So Louisa is the executive director of the Associates of the Boston Public Library. She's the top dog, the big honcho, the top banana. She's at the top floor when you, that's her right there. She is always in the back of the room. So there she is, and you will always find her somewhere in the back of the room, but that's Louisa. So um, you can ask Louisa or Laura, who's in the blue jacket over there, or um, our newest and, uh, 
staff person, Vidisha, who's been pretty incredible already, or, or me. We'll be happy to answer as many questions as we can if you have any. So, we're really, so please do stop by and make sure we have your name and we can keep up with um, you know, letting you know what's going on. And thank you so much for attending tonight's event. It is such an exciting time to see these careers really flourishing and bringing beauty and importance to our world and for young people to really fe feel seen and heard and understood. So you, you know, everybody has a calling. Your calling of writing is something that is going to make a huge difference to so many young people. So thank you for, you know, starting that journey here. Or maybe not starting it here, but allowing us to push forward your, um, your talent. So thank you all for attending tonight and for cheering on our newest writer in res residence. And now I'm asking you to join us in a reception to toast our two authors. And please note that the bar will be open until 7.30. But you are welcome to stay until 8 o'clock. And I'm going to tell you why I'm announcing that. The library closes at 8 o'clock, so you need to get out, <laughs> OK? So you can get a drink at 7.45 if you, well, no, you can't. You can get one at 7.30, but please leave by 8 o'clock, OK? Thank you all very much, and we're so happy to have you. Thank you.